over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'll begin in verse 32 and read through verse 40. Let's stand for the reading of God's word and continue to stand for prayer. The writer says, For what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight, flight the enemy, the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Ken Rennie, would you pray this morning as we look at God's word? You may be seated. As we've been studying uh, Hebrews chapter 11, I've, of course, been convinced of several things, and these have been renewed in my mind. First of all, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, if you're part of the brethren, then you are a man or woman of faith. Um, that is a gift from God, and so you can be called a man or woman of faith, and you have a heart for God because he's taken out that heart of stone and given you that heart that seeks after God. Number two, there will be times when you'll be weak in your faith, uh, you can just write that down, it'll happen. Sometimes you will be like that individual who says, I believe, help my unbelief. But also realize that your faith will be growing uh, because God is pleased to work in and through you to cause your faith to grow. Number three, this is important, as a man or woman of faith, you are pleasing to God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please Him. But by God's grace, we do have faith, that gift that He's given, and we are pleasing to Him. And the, really the important part of this is because when he looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of his son when he views us. Number four, you will endure to the end. There might be times when you don't want to endure, when you want to quit. But again, by God's grace, you will endure to the end because God is at work in you. Keep in mind again, it is not about great men and women. It's not about men and women with great faith. It's about men and women with faith in a great God. And God is faithful, and he will bring it about. Number five, which leads us into our study today, you will face struggles, trials, temptations, suffering, tribulation. In this world, you will face those things. But Jesus said, be of good cheer, for he's overcome the world. Now, with that being said, we have it pretty good. But don't think that your road to glory is going to be without pain. It will take place, you will suffer. And some of you here know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you here can tell your story, especially about your past, about the difficulties that you face, the hardship, the pain, and the agony, and the suffering. And for some of you, me just mentioning that just brings it right back up. It's as if it's as fresh right now as it was when it took place. And by and large, since you are a believer, you have worked to redeem the past. You have tried to examine it and look at it through eyes that says God was in control. He had a plan and he had his purpose for it. And so you've done that work and you're, you're trying to sustain that disposition and that God is still glorious and, and great and gracious even in those things in the past. But the truth of the matter is really more about what you're experiencing now. It's those present concerns, um, those near future things that you expect to take place. And for some of you find it almost unbearable. The fallout is coming to you because of what other people have done. 
I remember one of the saints that I know talked about how oftentimes they feel like it's a situation where someone's thrown that rock in the water. And you know how out from that comes the waves. And it hits you as it comes out from where someone else has caused a problem. They said, but it doesn't stop there because then it hits the shore and comes right back and hits you again. And you feel like you're just in the wake of not your own problems, your own failures, but because of what other people have done. Well, I want you to know that today is for you, what we're going to look at. And it's not because misery loves company. It's because God's word reminds us that we will suffer in this world and there's something better for us in the future. Um, in order to get into this passage, we're going to see three main groupings again. There are the some and others and the still others. That's the first group we'll see. The second group is going to be the they were group. And the last group is the wanderers. The wanderers. And each group has three different, or three statements about the first two and then two about the last particular category, who the wanderers were. As I thought about the wanderers, I thought to myself, we should change the name of our church to the wanderers. Wouldn't that be good? And I thought if I was clever, I could string together a bunch of names of churches. Um, like if you don't know where you're going, you can go to the Navigation Church nowadays. And they'll tell you to cross the bridge. Um, and so that the sojourners, I think, should become wanderers. But I really was thinking in recent weeks, I was going to propose that we change our name, actually, to the really, 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 really enjoy church.tv. I, I think that's a name that we should, should we go for. Actually, what we look at today is a little bit more painful than the names of churches. We're going to talk about suffering of individuals in the past. And we're going to start with the some, the others, and the still others. Look at verses 35 and 36 again. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, of chains and imprisonment. This first group includes women who receive back their dead. And someone would say, well, you're talking about suffering. Why do you bring this individ these individuals up? These people were raised back to life. You know, it's interesting. Almost every commentary wanted to put them in the really glorious exploits of God camp. And I think that's true. But I think they missed two important points. First of all, these women lost their children. The children died. And that seems to be glossed over. They had no idea that their children would be raised back to life. They just lost their child. And not only that, but their children would die again. So these mothers who receive back their children, if they live long enough and outlive their children, they might see their child die a second time. You see, I think what is glorious is that God is at work and he causes life, but there's still pain in the process. And we can't miss that particular point. We can think about individuals in Scripture, the widow of Zarephath, you remember her? This is the widow that uh, Elijah met as he was going about the countryside. He met her and he said, could you please feed me? And she said, I only have a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. I'm going to go home right now. My son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to die. Elijah went to that house, and you know that the flour didn't run out. The oil didn't run out. So that woman, that widow, saw God's miraculous hand at work. And then suddenly her son took ill and died. And then she was upset with Elijah. Why have you come to cause me dilemma and problems? And Elijah, a man of faith, because of a great God, called out to God, and God restored the life of that son to that widow at Zarephath. So this is the first group here, uh, individuals who saw death, and there was deliverance. The next group speaks about those who saw death and weren't delivered. They were tortured. Extra-biblical literature has lots of individuals that would be included in this. Uh, history records individuals like during the Maccabean era, Eleazar. He was told that if you eat the pork, then we'll let you live. But if you don't, then we're going to kill you. And he wouldn't defile himself with what was considered unclean in the Old Testament. I, I pulled off of my shelf yesterday the book, uh, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, if you haven't ever looked through that, you might want to get a copy and just look through some of the history of, of the early saints. A couple that I glanced at quickly, Polycarp, a man who loved the Lord and would, would not deny his faith. So they put him on a stake, and they set the fire beneath him. But the fire wasn't sufficient to consume him, so they took a sword and stabbed him. And out of his side came blood sufficient to put out the fire, and he still didn't die. But he would not deny Christ. I think about Sanctus, uh, an individual I read a little bit more about in another book. Uh, it was recorded also in the Fox Book of Martyrs. How they took irons prepared in the fire, and they placed it on his body. And it burned through the skin. 
But it not only burned the skin, it burned down to his bones. And yet, in that agonizing pain with those irons upon him, he would rise up and still confess that Jesus is Lord. He wouldn't deny the faith. These individuals were tortured, and yet they wouldn't renounce Christ or stop trusting in the one true God, the Lord God Almighty, Jehovah. They, they stood firm, desiring that better resurrection, the one that is to come. The third group within this, the some, the others, and still others, are individuals who apparently didn't die, although some of their suffering could have led to that. They just, they received odd afflictions like mockings. Um, Elisha was a guy who was mocked. Uh, for those of you who are bald, you're in good company. He was too. And he was ridiculed for being bald. It's bad enough you lose your hair, then you have to have someone call you out about it, right? But here's an individual, because he was a man of God, that was ridiculed. You've, you've already read about Jeremiah, the suffering prophet, thrown in a dungeon where there was mire, where he was sinking and was going to die in that place. It's interesting, though, as you look at Jeremiah. Let's go actually look at him for just a moment. Go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah is a man who spoke the word of the Lord. The Spirit came upon him and through him penned the very words of God. Jeremiah chapter 17 are some of those glorious words of God that he was the recipient of that he would not only record, but he would have known this and remembered these truths in his life. Look at Jeremiah 17 and verse 7. These are the words of the Lord from verse 5. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he'll be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. fruit. Go down to verse 14 and look at how um, the prophet responds to this truth in his own words. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Indeed, they say to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd who follows you, nor have I desired the woeful day. You know that what came out of my lips, it was right there before you. Do not be a terror to me. You are my hope in the day of doom. Let them be ashamed to persecute me. But do not let me be put to shame. Let them be dismayed. But do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom and destroy them with double destruction. Go over to chapter 20. I want you to see how he continues to have that trust in God and the assurance that God is in control, this suffering servant of the Lord. Jeremiah 20, look at verse 7. O Lord, you have induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted violence and plunder because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Go down to verse 11. Even though he had this hardship. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But, O oh Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous and see the mind and heart, let me see your vengeance on them. For I have pleaded my cause before you. Verse 13, Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evildoers. So here we see a man who trusts in God who is like that tree planted by the water and grows and is strengthened, right? And this is beautiful. But you have to notice that he doesn't end at verse 13. Notice how quickly his tone changes in verse 14. Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father, saying, A male child has been born to you, making him very glad. And let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew and did not relent. Let, them, let him hear the cry of the morning and the shouting at noon, because he did not kill me from the womb, that my mother might have been my grave, and my mother always enlarged with me. Why did I come forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be confused with shame? That's a quick turn, isn't it? He's like bipolar, isn't he? Praising God and then cursing the day that he was born. 
one of the things that I have been trying to do diligently as we've studied Hebrews 11 is try and point out the weakness of these men and women of faith. Because I think there's encouragement for us in that. We can go from one moment praising God to wishing we were never born. And what's wonderful about this is God still sees us as acceptable. And we're still pleasing in His sight. If you're struggling, He already knows your heart. Just cry out. And just say to Him, I wish I hadn't been born. And you'll find that that still small voice will break through in the right moment. And He will renew your strength. He will give you the presence, the pleasure of His presence. And that confidence that goes with it. So this is the some, the others, and still others. Let's go back to Hebrews now because we want to see the they were group. The they were group, verse 37, the first part. Hebrews 11, 37, they were stoned. They were sawn in two. Uh, they were tempted. That's probably something inserted by a copyist at some point. That probably isn't original with the text, but for those who have experienced great temptation, it is painful. And then they were the they were slain with the sword individuals. They were stoned. Um, that has a different connotation in our world today to be stoned. And that day they took stones and they threw them at individuals and they piled the stones upon the people and they often most likely died. Zechariah in the Old Testament, you know of Stephen in the New Testament. They were sawn in two. I hadn't really stopped and thought about that much until this last week. Could you imagine how much hatred somebody must have for someone to cut them in two? Cutting someone's head off, I think, seems to be almost merciful because that's pretty quick. You're done. But could you imagine the pain of being sawn in two and still not denying the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, tradition has it that Isaiah was a prophet who was cut in two. Must have been by evil individuals. And then they were killed with the sword. Do you recall that we've already looked how the exploits of individuals, they escape the edge of the sword? That doesn't always happen. Sometimes the people of God are killed by the sword. Jezebel, you remember her? That woman that Elijah ran away from? He had just called down fire from heaven. The prophets of Baal were defeated on that day. And then a Jezebel's after him. And what's he do? He runs away. And oh, by the way, there's another demonstration of a man weak, even though he has a faith. Just let me die. It's better for me to die than to live. He had good reason to fear Jezebel. The Bible tells us that she massacred the prophets of God with the sword. Hundreds of them were massacred by this woman Jezebel. So these are individuals who suffered and they died. And then we have the wanderers. The wanderers. Look at the last part of verse 37 and 38. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Uh, the first individuals of the wanderers were without provision. They didn't have clothed clothing and food. And you say, wait a second, hasn't God made a promise that he will always provide food and clothing for his children? Yes, he has. This is a reminder that his promise is not measured out by what we think is right. His promise is measured out by his will. And sometimes you'll go without, but you will always have enough food and clothing, even if it happens to be camel's hair like John the Baptist, who ate locusts and wild honey, who, by the way, was beheaded. Keep that in mind as well. So he suffered as well, the last prophet of the Old Testament. The second group are those who are without a home. This is kind of hard for us to imagine, isn't it? How many bathrooms do we have in our homes nowadays? Some of us had to struggle when we were growing up. There was only one bathroom for the six family members, you know? Of course, my parents told a tougher story that there was an outhouse, you know? Nowadays, there's a bathroom for most everybody, isn't there? We don't know what it's like to go without a home, but believers in other parts of the world, they do. Um, I saw the report this morning about all the refugees who are being rescued off the Mediterranean Sea nowadays. And I know not all of them are fleeing because of per persecution for religious reasons, but a lot of them are. And they're out there left to die, and other nations are stepping up and, and rescuing them. I don't know about you, I'm persuaded. I really don't want to live in verses 32 through 34. I mean, through 35 through 38, do you? Actually, I want to live in 32 and 35. I don't want to live here. I, I don't want to have to face this persecution. The thought of someone saying to me, you have a choice. You can deny Christ or we'll take this saw and cut you in two. That's not 
not real appealing to me. I, I do think I would much prefer verses 32 through 34, don't you? These great exploits. Let's, let's subdue some kingdoms. How about that? Let's escape the sword. Let's, let's, put, let's quench the fires and let's turn armies to flight. Um, this would be, seem to be a much better place to be to me. But in God's economy, he has different stations for us at different seasons of our lives and including different locations here on this earth. And with that, I, I, have, I have a couple of thoughts because I think oftentimes, even though we have it good, I think sometimes we feel like we're wanderers and sometimes I think we feel like people are dying all around us unexpectedly. So a couple of statements to close out this chapter, similar to last week. And again, I want to remind you, all these statements are for believers. For those of you who haven't trusted in Christ, I don't know how you get through. And I want to call you again this day to repent of your sins and trust in Christ. If you haven't done that, I was thinking about someone recently who I think is very lethargic around the things of the gospel and the things of Christ. And I wonder if they really fear what hell must be like. I wonder if they've really stopped and taken a hard look of what that existence must be like apart from God in the place of eternal torment. I kind of just want to shake some individuals and say, don't you understand? The sad thing is they don't apart from God's grace, but I still feel the need just to shake them and speak the truth. For those of you who are believers, the first thing is this. Prepare for suffering. You need to prepare for suffering. It will come. One of the delights that a, a shepherd has in the church is to prepare people for eternity. To talk about that glorious estate one day when we get home to heaven. It's going to be great. We're going to get those new bodies that are not going to grow old. We're never going to sin. We'll still have choice, but every one of our choices is going to be something to please God. This is going to be great, isn't it? Because I get to decide, how do I want to worship God right now? Do I want to stand? Do I want to fall on my face? What do I want to do? But every choice is righteous. But there's another part that I feel is neglected by a lot of shepherds, under shepherds of the flocks. And that is to prepare people for suffering. I, I don't know that that's really presented that well and that often. You will suffer in this life. It is not going to be a cakewalk. And the writer of Hebrews is very diligent to do this. He is taking them through the pace of saying, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. You have not yet suffered to the shedding of blood, but it is coming. And I say that kind of with the twofold concept. As men and women of faith, and you know who you are, you know that you have and will experience suffering. It will take place. But I wonder also if perhaps God might not have difficulty ahead for this nation and this generation still. There's no guarantee, folks. It could all collapse. And I wonder if we're really ready for such an outcome. I wonder if we'll really know how to band with one another and care for one another and minister to one another. I joke sometimes about our survival team, about the team that we're going to put together when, the, when it all falls apart, you know. And I want you to know my wife wasn't on that team for a long time. Um, she, had, she had foo-foo shoes. She wasn't ready to run. But it wasn't that long ago we went down to Missouri and we were shooting guns with some folks. And I'm telling you what, she can fire a gun. She's back on the team. We're ready. <laughs> we talk about those kinds of things. And there's people nowadays who dig holes and they bury toilet paper and food that's supposed to last for a year. It's not enough, folks. It'll run out. And honestly, it's not about all those provisions. It is about our spiritual walk and strength with God that'll get us through. And we can stand assured His grace is sufficient. He'll always take care of His own. Go with me to Romans chapter 8 for just a moment. And I, I ask you maybe to hold your place there because I think I might want to come back. I think it is good periodically to read all of Romans 8, but especially the last part. So we might come back and read that in closing today. But notice in Romans 8 verse 16, the true battle front that is expressed by this author has to do with spiritual things and that knowledge of who we are and to whom we belong. Look at Romans 8, 16. This is a wonderful truth uh, that should give comfort to you. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. This is verse 16, that we are the children of God. At one time we were enemies of God, folks, but his Spirit assures our spirit that we are his children. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified together. 
For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he says, let's balance it out. Let's see where we're going here. What's weightier? Present suffering? No. Eternal glory. That's, what is, that's what's weighty. And that's what we long for. That's where we're heading. And that's what keeps us during this time of suffering to know that that's what awaits us. So save your spot here in Romans. Um, let's go back and look at verse 38 of Hebrews because there's a phrase in there that brings me to the second thought. You see, like Moses, we have to be willing to reject the passing pleasure of the sin of this world and also reject the riches of Egypt and all that it offers and take up the reproach of Christ. When we do that, realize, look at verse 38 again, of whom the world was, <coughs> excuse me, of whom the world was not worthy. The world <coughs> is not worthy of you as a Christian. This place here is not worthy of your presence. If you're a child of God, good thing I'm not running for political office. Just taking that drink of water would have disqualified me. It would be all over. You can YouTube that and find out which candidate did that about a year ago. You should not be surprised that the world loves its own and hates you. Jesus said, the world hated me, fully expect it to hate you. This world is not our, it's not our home, folks. We're passing through. Early believers were persecuted, they were stoned, they were crucified. And yet, our suffering is so mild compared to those individuals, isn't it? A couple of weeks ago, I was outside working in my yard, and I was creating a, a new sidewalk with these paver stones, and I dropped one on my toe. And I thought, I smashed my toe, and I looked at it, and it wasn't smashed, but I knew the nail was gone, right? That's suffering right there. And then I compare to that, I, I, every now and then I look at my pinky. My left pinky is shorter than my right one because when I was a kid, I fell off of a, um, a heat tank that had oil in it. I was about six years old, and my dad was working in his office putting up some paneling. So I went around the backside to clinch the nails, and I fell. And my finger, not the nail, there was a box there that had one of these big copper staples and just ripped my finger from down here in the, in the meat of my hand all the way up to the top edge. It was a Friday night. And the doctor had been drinking, so he stitched me up without giving me any kind of pain or numbing medication. Four stitches, and they're as crooked as can be, and so my pinky is much shorter on the left side than the right side. That's suffering, right? I think about an um, individual in our church right now that has leg cut off. Now we're starting to get a little more severe, right? In his room, when you know last night over at Barnes, this gentleman, we're in there, and I don't even know what we said. I don't think it was anything really pertinent. He says, where do you go to church? He didn't know who I was. And I and got to talking to him, and he's a believer. He had a brain tumor 25 years ago that's back now. And uh, had it already removed the second time in January, but now he's relapsing already again. These are still mild, folks, these sufferings. Around the world right now, there's young girls who are being abused because they're believers. Right now, there are people being thrown off of a boat because they're Christians. Right now, there are people, there have, in recent weeks, people who have been beheaded for nothing other than being a Christian. You know, our mild afflictions, and they're real, they're, they're present, I get all of that. But what if God's hand is removed from the United States of America? Are we prepared for that? I'm challenged because I don't think I really understand what's going on globally as well as I should. And then I have to also be further challenged because I don't know that I'm praying the way that I should for these believers, not so much for their physical suffering, but that they would continue to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I wonder, are we prepared? There, there, you know, when it comes down to it, the writer of Hebrews is going to say, really one of the big keys here is to keep your eyes on Christ. We're going to see that in chapter 12. I'm going to read it in just a moment. But, but our eyes are all over, aren't they? The next thing that we need, that, that car, the, the remodel of our house, the, that piece of clothing or jewelry, that modern media device, this is where our eyes typically tend to be. Our gaze has got to be upon Christ. Look at verse 39 and going into chapter 12. 
And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that says before us, looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The road to glory for Christ was one of pain. Should we think it would be anything less for us? The road to glory filled with suffering for God's purposes. Individuals who set their gaze upon Jesus Christ, men and women of faith, have a good testimony from God that you are pleasing to Him. These individuals, the Bible says, did not receive the promise. There was lots of promises. There was land, there was children, there was victory, but they didn't receive the promise. And the promise has to be Jesus Christ. Because all the promises of God are yes and amen in Him. That is the ultimate promise. And if you are found in Christ then you have all things that he gives to us. The saints of all times will be made perfect together because Jesus at Calvary suffered and died and paid for our sins. He rose to secure our justification. He's ascended on high. He's coming again to glorify us, to take us to himself. And there we'll have this eternal state. But right now, right now, awaiting that, we've got to get our eyes on Christ. He, he has got to be our muse. He has got to be our all in all. And you say, but it's not that bad. If it should come, are you prepared? Your faith has to be strengthened now for that day of trial and tribulation. And even if you don't suffer for Christ, if you grow old enough, you will suffer in Christ. And the question is, how will you go out with a blaze of glory, keeping your eyes on Christ? Will you grow old and become bitter or graceful? Which is it? Keep your eyes on Christ, the prize, the promise. In that you will find your faith will be strengthened and you will be prepared. Are you prepared to suffer? I don't think I am. I know in that hour he'll give me what I need, but I, right now I'm not ready. I'm not prepared for that kind of suffering. And I mean really suffer. How comfortable are you in this world? How much has this really become your home? Or are you looking for that city whose builder and architect is the Lord? Will you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ? The answer is no, apart from His grace. Because we're not strong enough to keep our eyelids open, to keep our eyes on Him. He has to set our eyes upon Him in order for it to take place. I wonder if it wouldn't be healthy for us to close out with Romans 8. Let's do that. Let's go back there. Would you please stand with me? I'd like to read the closing part of this chapter. Because as much as I want to alert you to be prepared for suffering, I need to remind you that God is faithful. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Can I get an amen on that? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are all killed all day long. We are accused, are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear Father, we are thankful that on this side of Calvary, we are able to embrace fully the promise of your Son. You've given us so much more understanding, so much more insight, so much more knowledge. And yet, Lord, we recognize that all of these things would only be head knowledge apart from your Spirit granting to us the understanding with the true heart. And our desire, Lord, is that our feelings match up with your truth, that our knowledge be according to your truth, 
that there would be such a strong connection between what we know and how we live and how we feel that no matter what comes our way, that like Paul, we could say whether we abound or we're abased, it is all for your glory and we know how to be content because we have that which is imperishable. The presence of your Son, the promise that you've given to us that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and the assurance that one day you will come again and you will receive us to yourself and we will be with you forever. In the meantime, Lord, the journey's not done. The road up the mountain that leads to you is an uphill climb. There are struggles along the way. But we rest assured that your strong right hand will always undergird us, protect us, and safeguard us for whatever your purposes are. And Lord, should we encounter the suffering of the saints of old, may we in that hour prove to be your children. May we continue to affirm that your Son is Lord of all. That there is but one true God who rules over heaven and earth, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, and the one who has done all of it for your praise and for your glory. We are thankful, we're grateful. We want to give you praise, but may that be not just with our lips this morning, but with how we conduct ourselves while we wander about here on earth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.